All right, everybody, appreciate you guys uh, joining us during lunch today to talk about everybody's favorite topic, uh, OSHA logs and reporting to the federal government. So uh, I'm Greg Deems. I'm one of the partners at Rogers Gray on the commercial side of things and manage the OSHA logs portal that we have for our clients and friends on our end. So at the end of this, if, you know, if you're not on the portal and you'd like access to it, there's no charge to use it. Uh, and I can connect with you, walk you through how to use it. First report of injury, do the logs. Um, with me today is going to be Dustin from Emerge Apps, who created OSHA logs. He's going to talk to you about a lot of the new, new-ish last couple of years, compliance issues, who needs to keep logs, when you have multiple locations, how many do you have to keep them at. He's sort of our OSHA guru, and it's something that I am throwing a curveball on. He's my first call, so I thought, why not hear it right from him? So with that, I'll turn it over to him and uh, he'll walk you through all the new updates, all the compliance and, and a little bit of OSHA logs and how we work from there. Beautiful. Greg, thank you so much. And when I was a young wee lad, my goal in life was to be the OSHA record keeping guru. So I have met my life's goals so far. So hopefully you can see my screen. You guys see my screen good? Um, appreciate everybody being here. Justin, while you're going, just if anybody has any questions as he goes, if you put them in the chat, uh, we'll have some time at the end and uh, we'll read them off to him and, and answer anything that comes up. Yes, fire them away. Uh, but yes, thank you, Greg, for the nice introduction. Excited to be here. Yes, I am the creator of OSHALogs.com. We built OSHA logs uh, to really help employers take the guesswork out of OSHA record keeping. Uh, you fill out one simple form. It creates PDF versions of all the OSHA records. It populates your state's workers' count first report of injury form at the same time. It does all sorts of really slick injury metrics. We have an entire team here that helps employers really, um, you know, if they have questions with, with some, you know, very particular OSHA record keeping scenarios. Uh, we have thousands of employers using uh, the system nationwide. Just as we launched the system, now it's been over eight years now since we launched the system, uh, OSHA passed some really sweeping changes to the OSHA record keeping rules, uh, which mandated uh, many employers uh, to now electronically submit their data to the federal government on an annual basis. Before this rule, employers had to keep track of their OSHA logs on paper forms, but now the federal government, with this change, required uh, employers to now also submit it to them. So those are a big fundamental change. It made uh, the importance of OSHA logs dot com that much bigger of a deal, more important for employers, uh, but that also required uh, yours truly to become an expert in everything related to the submission rule and stay up to date with these changes year in year out you know with our system we work directly with osha with submissions we'll get into that and so we really um pride ourselves on to knowing what has changed and what is coming down the pike which we will get into today my goal for you is to save you some time my assumption is you aren't as excitable as i am when it comes to the osha record keeping rule so we put together this webinar um, uh, to bring you all up to speed. Help you prepare for the upcoming compliance deadline, the submission rule set, help you prepare for what we see as probably the biggest shift since this new rule set, which is coming next year. Won't be due for this submission season, but it's important for you to prepare for that, which we'll get into. Uh, so the agenda, uh, as uh, my good friend Greg kind of highlighted, we're going to go over some OSHA record keeping 101 really quick, right? Who must keep the records in the first place? What's this thing called an establishment and why does that matter? What incidents do I need to record? That's going to give us the information we need to decide as an employer, do you need to digitally submit your data up to the federal government? We're going to hit those changes I mentioned earlier for 2023, what you should do now uh, here in the month of December and in January to prepare your data uh, for submission for this submission year. And then we will give an overview of the OSHA logs program, which as a client or friend of the fine folks at Rogers Gray, you get scholarship uh, access to uh, the system. Uh, no strings attached, no cost, which is very nice of them. As Greg mentioned, if you have questions, shoot them over in the chat and uh, he's going to collect those and we will grab those at the end of the session here. So let's start with an overview, right? So let's go way back in time to the early 1970s. It, this is when OSHA um, was put in place, it was during the next administration. And it is here where OSHA put in a rule that, uh, or when OSHA came into effect, 
One of the parts of it was the employers have to keep track of their injuries. Why does OSHA want, why do they want employers to do that? So they know what injuries are happening in what industries and what rules and regulations they should be putting into effect um, to protect employees and keep them safe at work. There's three forms. These forms have stayed pretty uh, much the same over the years. There's been a couple changes, been some rule changes in terms of you know what you need to track and what you don't. But fundamentally, we uh, have three OSHA forms, the OSHA form 301, the OSHA Form 300 and the OSHA Form 300A. The OSHA Form 301 is the first form we'll talk about. This is the injury and illness in incident in, uh, report. For the first forms completed when an employee is injured, the key thing is individual injury, individual form. If Greg and I are working for our employer, we both get injured, we're both going to have one of these forms. Legally, OSHA asks you to complete this within seven calendar days. What's tracked on these forms? It's information about the employee, where they were treated, and then the more kind of interesting risk management type information. Uh, what was the employee doing before the injury occurred? What happened? What was the injury or illness? And what object or substance harmed the employee? So again, one injury, one person, one form. Then we get the second form, which is the OSHA 300, otherwise known as the OSHA log. Every individual injury that we fill out for that 301 is going to be a line item on this form. So again, Greg and I get injured. I'm going to be a line item. He's going to be a line item. What's being tracked on this form, it is the employee's name, their job title, the date of the injury, where the event occurred. We describe the injury or illness. We classify the case as either a death, a days away, job transfer, or other recordable case. How many days away? How many job transfer days? And then what kind of injury, is it an injury, skin disorder, respiratory condition, poisoning, hearing loss, all other illnesses. We then total that up at the bottom. And it is where we take that information and we carry that over to the third form, which is the OSHA form 300A. This is the summary data, right? Interesting name, right? Makes sense. Uh, that must then be signed by a company executive at the end of the year and must be printed and posted for employees to see typically by other employment uh, labor posters, you know, in the break room, uh, where, wherever that type of information normally be, be um, presented. It must be printed and posted from February to April of every year, right? So we're coming up the end of the year for 2022. You must print your 2022 OSHA uh, 300A, post it from February to April. Sometimes I see where companies are posting there are 300 and the 301s, you don't do that. It's only that summary 300A. The OSHA records as a whole have historically been and still remain to be the case, a very important aspect of OSHA and interaction with the OSHA inspectors. Um, knock on wood, if you were to get an OSHA inspection, whether uh, you know, from an employee whistleblowing situation or just a planned inspection for your industry and, and, and where, where you are, um, regionally, it's one of the first things an OSHA inspector will ask for, your OSHA records. Legally, you have to provide them within four business hours, and, you, and they can ask for up to five years back. If you talk to OSHA inspectors, they will tell you sub, uh, subjectively how quick and how fast and how organized and how confident you are in presenting this information to them. goes a long way to telling them what? That you've got your OSHA and your safety act together. But if you're fumbling, if you're bumbling through, trying to find them, if they're half filled out, um, that's going to tell them that if you can't even do the OSHA logs right, what are you missing from an OSHA safety standpoint? So we always uh, want to highlight that. If you are in the uh, building trade, you know that general contractors may be asking for this information as well, uh, because progressive companies have caught on that what you see on these OSHA logs will open up and, and show a pattern for more severe injuries down the line. For example, a recent study, this was done by Canonical Phillips, showed that for every lost workday incident, there is a, um, a 10 recordable incidents that they find on an OSHA log. And then they went even one step further that there's that another 10 near misses for every recordable incident. So large companies want to see patterns. And again, that is what OSHA wants to see as well. That's why they want this data. So back in 2016, this is when this new rule set came into effect. Remember, 1970s is when OSHA came into effect. It took to 2016 that OSHA says, hey, 
You know, um, we want this data before this new rule set where companies had to digitally submit their data to the federal government. OSHA would only get access to less than 1% of all the companies in the grand old United States that had to complete OSHA forms. And they got that through inspection activity. OSHA in this rule said, you know, we're going to flip the script here. We want to get access and flip it the other way around. So employers now have to submit this data directly to them, even when there's not any inspection activity going on. So this can this was a huge change. This continues to be a huge change. The folks at Rogers Gray were really ahead of the curve to help employers uh, uh, get compliant with this and to remain in compliance with this. Um, Greg, how many we've done these these webinars for many years? So it's been uh, you know it's been really nice helping uh, helping folks in your neck of the woods with this. I feel a little old now. I didn't realize this was our sixth one. <laughs> Yeah, we're, we're getting old. I'm getting a little more gray in that beard there, uh, there, Greg, but um, at least I have my hair, right? Um, that's that's something I need because um, I would be a very funny looking man with no hair, that's for sure. Um, I would say, uh, so got to send the data up to the federal government. Um, you must send between January 1 through March 2nd. And if you don't, you can be uh, fined. It's now the fine is up to just north of $15,000 for not submitting uh, that they can levy against you. The, um, uh, but more importantly, what happens if you don't submit and OSHA comes to see you for that reason, they can come do a full blown inspection on your organization. We'll get into that a little bit today here. Um, where do we start? So how do we, how do we go from you know, figure it out. Do we have to do OSHA records all the way to do we have to do the electronic submission? Um, we have to start really to figure out in the first place as an organization, do we need to keep track of the OSHA logs in the first place? So who, who must keep OSHA records? Not every employer does. Uh, OSHA gives a, 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 a criteria, um, but the vast majority of employers do. So the first um, criteria we look at there's two of them. One is the number of employees. So 10 or fewer do not have to comply um, with, uh, if they have 10 or fewer employees, they do not have to comply. So if they have 11 or more in the previous calendar year, they um, must uh, digitally, or they must keep track of the logs. Um, this is a very broad calculation. So this includes all workers, all full-time, part-time, temporary employees, seasonal employees, exceptions for family members of a family farm, uh, and there's exceptions for owners and partners of sole proprietorships. So the key thing here is a slice and kind calculation. So if Greg and I own a business and we just for one day, we hire a seasonal employee to come rake leaves for us in the fall because we hate raking leaves and we, that tips us over that 11 mark, um, we would then have to keep OSHA logs for the next for the next uh, calendar year. So very broad slice and time calculation. I always bring it up because with all the different employment rules and labor you know rules with Cobra and FMLA, there's always different ways to calculate that. This is one of the broadest and more most inclusive. The second exemption has to do with the establishments industry. Establishments in certain low hazard industries are exempt. Um, full service restaurants are one of the exemptions. Kind of. The, probably the most oddballish ones that, that's exempt. Uh, insurance carriers are exempt, religious organizations, usually those companies who historically have not had a lot of injuries. So I don't know about you, uh, uh, Greg, and your insurance agency there, unless you guys are battling every day and fighting each other, you're probably not having lots of injuries you know, at the workplace. So that's why historically insurance folks have been excluded. Uh, but the vast majority of employers have to do these OSHA records, even if they have zero injuries. So we'll get into that too. All of that industry stuff is based on a company's NAICS code. Um, and that's a North American Industry Classification Code System. That's a newer version of an SIC code. If you don't know your SIC code, you can look it up within OSHAlogs.com. You can also look at it up. Oddly enough, it's all that data for the government stored up in the Census Bureau's website, which you'll see here. Or you can use this little tool called Google and say, what is my NAICS? And, uh, and you can find it there. Um, so once we figure out as an entity, as an organization, do we have to keep track of OSHA records? Then we have to look at, are we setting up our establishments um, correctly? 
What's an establishment? So you hear me talking about the company logs. The establishment is probably the most important definition um, that you as a company, and if you're responsible for doing these uh, for your company, to really get your, your mind around. For most companies, it's not going to be that difficult to figure out, but we'll explain some scenarios where it can be. Um, first and foremost, it's important definition is employers must keep track of OSHA records independently for each of their establishments. Nine out of 10 times, a physical location is an establishment. Easiest way to think about it. Establishment is a single physical location where business is conducted or where services or industrial operations uh, are performed. For activities where uh, employees do not work at a single physical location, uh, the establishment is then represented by a main or branch office that then supervises such activities such as construction, transportation, uh, service workers. There are some uh, anomalies or, or interesting scenarios. I will say without getting too deep into it right here, let's say you are a janitorial firm and you have, let's say a hundred janitors that come into work and then you go out and you work on your different uh, sites that you may do janitorial work for. That you can tie those employees to one establishment, but if those janitors go physically to their locations each day and they don't go anywhere else, those could be considered their own individual establishments. So if we start talking about in this section and you're concerned or you're worried about is your establishments uh, set up correctly, reach out to myself or Greg after this presentation and we will walk you through those. Um, many employers uh, make the mistake of, hey, we're an entity, we're a company, I have to keep track of this wonderful OSHA 300 and have a 300A that this very excitable individual that teaches me every year with the Rogers Greg webinar told me about. Um, but if you don't listen and you just sign off right now and you do it wrong, you would be wrong in this scenario. If you have four locations throughout um, your locale and you're doing one set of OSHA logs, you wouldn't be in compliance. You need to do a set of logs for each of your establishments, which most of the time is considered a physical location. As I just mentioned, so most of the time an establishment is a single physical location. However, there's some unique scenarios where you may combine two or more physical locations into a single establishment when they meet these three criteria. Operate as a single business under common management, which is pretty easy to find if it's our company and entities uh, locations. Here's a key one. If they're all located within close proximity to each other and the employer keeps one set of business records for the locations. So number two is the key one you got to look at. So let's assume Greg and I own a business. We have a business office on the road, right down the road. Then we have a warehouse. And then a little bit further down the road, uh, we have um, a sales office. Those are within close proximity. The way OSHA defines that is within a block of each other. That's as detailed as they get. If they are, we have the option to lump them all together under one establishment. There's also scenarios where you may divide one location into two or more establishments when each of the establishments represents a distinctly separate business. And that's based on their NAICS code, the industry description. Two, the business is engaged in different economic activity, which would go along with the uh, first. No one industry description applies to the joint activities of the establishment and separate reports are routinely prepared for each establishment. Here's the scenario. Let's say Greg and I have been running a lumber yard for many years together in a business partnership, and we decided, hey, we've got this wonderful building, we've got extra space, let's now also run a construction company out of this location. Just because it's the same location doesn't mean it is the same entity, the same establishment, so we split those out into separate ones. Again, you need help with this, we're here to help you. Um, but if you're currently keeping your logs lumped together by, e by employer or insurer establishment status, now is the perfect time to fix that as we're getting into the, uh, the submission season. So now that we looked at, as an employer, do we have to keep OSHA records? We looked at how do we organize them by establishment? Then we have to look at, are we putting the right injuries on these forms in the first place? How confident are you in the quality of the data that you have on your logs? How confident are you in knowing what is recordable and what is not on these logs? This data is being made public by OSHA. It's kind of buried in OSHA's website, um, but part of their goal for the upcoming years is to make this much easier for uh, the general public to search and sift 
through um, uh, this data. If you uh, listen, uh, like Greg and I do, to the different you know safety websites and and um, you know insurance type stuff and risk management type websites, you you'll see some articles out there about how Amazon has some some uh, bad injury data, and I think one of the uh, statistics is they have double the amount of injuries than any other warehouse entity. Well, where are they getting that information from? These reporters are getting them from this OPTRA database. Uh, so um, interesting how that will be used in the future. So we, so the point is we don't want to over-report, right? We, of course, don't want to under-report, but we don't want to put more injuries on there than, than need to be. So we want to make sure um, everybody understands the rules. OSHA records are designed to collect, compile, and analyze uniform and consistent nationwide data on injuries and illnesses. Workers' comp injuries are designed to provide medical coverage and compensation for workers who are injured or made ill at work, and it differs from state to state. If something's work comp, eight out of 10 times is probably OSHA reportable, and if it's OSHA reportable, it uh, probably is a workers' comp scenario. Um, but I will tell you, what's compensable for workers' comp in your state and what's compensable for workers' comp in my state here in Michigan are, are different. But what, from an OSHA record standpoint, totally the same. Workers' comp impact, whether it's compensable workers' comp, has no impact on whether it's OSHA recordable or not. You have to follow the uh, OSHA's own workflow here, and they have a flow chart. They have a process. The first couple are pretty uh, simple. There are some weird caveats with them, but uh, not big enough of an issue where I would bring it up in this webinar. Did the employee experience an injury or illness? If yes, is it work-related? If yes, is it a new case, right? We don't want to keep tracking the same re-injury on logs every year. But where we get most of the questions is, of course, on this last section here, does the injury or illness meet the general recording criteria? If it is yes, then we put it on the log. So what are we talking about here? What is a, How do we know if an injury meets the general record-keeping criteria? OSHA tells us, that means a work-related injury or illness must be recorded if it results in one or more of the following. Death, days away from work, restricted work or transfer to another job. All those three are pretty obvious if they happen, right? Where we get most of the questions and where a lot of the uncertainty is, is it considered medical treatment? So that is one that, uh, you know, if we look at all the support questions we get in from, from folks in our support team uh, answering is, is this a medical treatment scenario or not? So we get to dive into the regulations. We got to see, okay, what wonderful clarity did OSHA give us to, to make these determinations? We look at uh, the definition they give for medical treatment. <clears throat> that should clear everything up for us, right? Medical treatment includes the management and care of a patient for the purpose of combating disease or disorder. And as Greg so rightfully smiled, that doesn't help us very much at all. Very broad. But what they do do is they work backwards and they give us exclusions. <clears throat> There's three specific exclusions of OSHA sites that if this is the scenario, they are not recordable on the OSHA law. The first has to do with observation or counseling. So if it's a visit to a physician or other licensed healthcare professional solely for observation and counseling is not considered medical treatment. What does that entail? So let's assume Greg and I are working in a factory, working out in a shared workspace. There's another building, there's a chemical plant right next to us. And somebody rushes over as we're in the middle of our job and they say, hey, we just had a chemical leak. And one of the things that happens with this chemical leak is if you inhale it, you know, four hours from now, you could get really sick. So you got to go to the hospital and you got to see if you're going to get sick or not because you want to be in the hospital if you do, because it can be deadly. If we're just there for observation and nothing happens to us, even if we're admitted to the hospital, it's not a reportable on the OSHA law. Unique scenario, but that's one of the uh, exclusions. The more common one, <laughs> would be diagnostic procedures. So diagnostic procedures are used to determine whether or not an injury illness exists and do not encompass treatment in and of itself. So Greg and I are working in that factory. Uh, Greg and I trip over a, you know, a box or something and, and we both go to the x-ray uh, or to the doctor to get an x-ray to see if we broke our ankle. Um, if they do the x-ray on us and we're fine, then that x-ray in and of itself does not constitute an OSHA reportable. But if they find something and they got to give us care, then it turns into an OSHA reportable. The most common one of the three is first aid cases. So if the medical treatment involves these first or the, any combination of these first aid, and this is as far as it goes, 
it's not recordable. It's a comprehensive list. So only these 14 count toward first aid. The first one is using non-prescription medication at non-prescription strength, administering tetanus immunizations, cleaning wounds on the surface of the skin, using bandages or gauze pads, using hot or cold therapy, using any non-rigid means of support, such as elastic bandages, <clears throat> excuse me, drilling of a fingernail or toenail to relieve pressure, to relieve pressure. That does not sound like a fun first aid scenario to go through. Uh, or draining fluid from a blister. The use of eye patches, removing foreign bodies from the eye using irrigation or cotton swab. Removing splinters or foreign material from others other than the eye by irrigation tweezers or cotton swabs. The use of massage therapy, drinking fluids for relief of heat stress, the use of finger guards, and using temporary immobilization devices while transporting the accident victim. These are the 14. Comprehensive. The professional status of the person giving the first aid has no impact on the recordability. So it could be a coworker who was grumpy in the picture, right? You don't want to get the first aid, but he gave it. It could be an HR person. It could be a nurse. It could be the best doctor in the world. It doesn't matter if it's first aid. It's first aid. It doesn't matter who gives it. So now that we looked at, as an entity, as an employer, do I have to keep track of OSHA logs? What forms am I tracking? Am I setting up my logs correctly by establishment? Am I following the right criteria to put these incidents on the form? Then I look at, do I have to now also, in addition to these rules that have been around forever, that I continue to have to do, but do I see if I'm one of the employers that have to also digitally submit this data up to the federal government? So who needs to do that? So OSHA gives us another set of criteria that are independent of all the other ones that we reviewed already. And they look at the industry once more. So the NAICS code, but then the size of the location itself, the size of that establishment. So if we have an establishment or location, right? So I use those terms interchangeably that has over 250 employees and I have to do OSHA records already, they're gonna to have to digitally submit the data no matter what. Pretty easy one to figure out there. This next group, if they have 20 to 249 employees at that establishment, uh, uh, other, otherwise right, that location, and they're in certain classified high-risk industries, that's how OSHA describes them, um, they will also have to digitally submit. It's 65% of all industries that get lumped into here. So it's not just a small subset. It's all agriculture firms, all utilities, all construction, all manufacturing, all wholesale trade, a bunch of other general industry that uh, falls into this. Uh, part of what's nice about the OSHA logs platform, which we'll get into when you go through the submission process, we will catch and we will be able to determine for you whether or not your locations need to submit based on your size and your industry. So you don't have to go into it knowing whether or not you need to submit. The submission process will make that determination for you. Uh, those companies with less than 20 employees don't have to submit digitally, but you still have to keep track of the records and everything else we've already discussed up until this point. Uh, so scenario here, we have four locations, okay? We have one location with six employees, one with 17, one with 25, one with uh, 260. The first two under 20, Got to keep the OSHA records for them, but we don't submit. The one with over 20, the 25 here, and we're a manufacturing entity, so we're one of the ones that fit into that 65% of all industries, we do have to submit. And then for our uh, uh, location with 260, it doesn't matter what industry we're in, we need to submit because um, uh, we have over 260 employees. What information are we sending? We're looking at the company information, right? And the establishment information, that location, you know, core data address, uh, number of employees, total hours work, and then all of that really special injury information that OSHA uses to slice and dice and to compare your organization to others in your industry and, try and make a decision. Are you safe? Are you not? Are you better than average? Are you worse than average? Could you be one that they want to come visit? Um, if you aren't um, in their mind um, doing the things you need to do to keep your employees safe. When do we submit? We submit by uh, March 2nd of each year. Uh, this is an older slide, so please forgive me. It is data from the 2022 log year that we will be submitting, right? Um, you must, if you're not using OSHAlogs.com, which we'll get into, you will have to set up a government website, log in. You have to type in 26 points of data for every one of your locations, uh, or you can do it with a CSV file. It's kind of complicated. 
um, kind of a pain. And that's one of the reasons why employers love using OSHA logs because it, as they're using OSHA logs throughout the year, we have an industry leading electronic submission uh, wizard. It takes about four minutes to work through and it's gonna do the submission directly for you. So think of it like TurboTax for OSHA records. I'll walk you right through that. Um, when you go through, you look at the rule set, it talks about, you know, um, really some strong language, you know, uh, when you submit, they want to make sure you're submitting correct information. So it says, uh, right on the page, when you submit violations of material, false, fictitious, fraudulent statements can be punished by a fine or by imprisonment of not more than five years or both. Um, do I think anybody's going to jail for OSHA record keeping? Probably not. And if you do, you better come up with a different reason why you're there because you might not survive in prison for that long. You got to have a tougher story, right, Greg? Could you, could you use that as your story? You don't want to use that story. Um, but what's happening, you are creating a digital trail, a breadcrumb. So, I mean, think of the, you know, these awful in, um, accidents that have happened recently, that Bo the Boeing plane accident where within a month, two um, accidents happen. What do the regulators do? They start peeling back all of the data and they look for things. So God forbid, knock on wood, you have a serious injury or even a death at your workplace. Uh, then the OSHA folks come in and they make sure, are you doing everything right? Have you submitted the data correctly? Um, could be 10 years, could be 15 years down the line. Let's hope it never happens, but you are created a digital trail. We want to make sure you're getting the right information so that can't that data can't be used against you in the future. Which gives me perfect uh, leeway right into how is OSHA using the data? Couple things, future legislation. This makes perfect sense, right? They're looking at where injuries are coming from, when is industries are having the injuries, where do they put their limited resources as an organization? It's gonna drive where they put their, their legislation uh, initiatives. The other one, which impacts you know, those of us on the call here, of course, is they are using this data as their primary way to target employers for workplace inspections. Now the inspection activity has been uh, minimal over the past couple of years around this rule set. And there's a really significant reason why, and unless you've been living under a rock, you probably know why, we had this little thing called a COVID-19 pandemic. So that shot up to the most important thing for OSHA to deal with uh, over these past two, three years. Now that that is subsiding, a lot of activities now moving back to this rule set to make sure employers are doing this. And um, earlier this year, in the month of April, if you want to uh, go look it up on OSHA's website, there's a press release. Where they talk about how they're going to go about doing that. And they're going to uh, create inspection lists based on four groups. Those companies with elevated DART rates, uh, days away restricted time. Those with increased DART rates from the year prior when they're submitting two years in a row. And those companies that aren't submitting at all, but should be. And then also they're going to inspect some companies with normal level of injuries just to make sure they're not you know, holding back on, uh, on the injury data. Um, so I'm not the brightest guy in the world, right, Greg? But I will tell you what companies do not fall into those four categories. There's no companies that don't fall into those four categories. So, you know, anybody can be a potential uh, target here. For those of you who don't know, what is DART rate? It is a recordable uh, number for every 100 full-time employees that resulted in one or more lost or restricted days. Um, and uh, it's not so much about the number of days, it is how many injuries cause at least one day or restricted days. This is the primary number that OSHA is using to, to pick which employers they wanna go after. There's a different DAR rate by industry. OSHA is not publicizing that. So they get a line benchmark of, you know, what's gonna cause a red flag in their system for each industry, but they're not publicizing that, just so you know. Uh, inspections related to this, of course, we're looking at the OSHA records, but it, they say right in the rule set, it becomes a comprehensive inspection. So anything else they find, any other citation, any other issue can be fined um, and cited just like anything else. Uh, the data they can request, you know, this year's data on all five years back. Legally, five years back is what an employer should be prepared to provide to an OSHA inspector. So be prepared, be prepared, be prepared. I, I hopefully said that enough times here. It goes a long way into creating the mood, to creating the uh, subjectivity to, hey, you are a company that takes uh, safety uh, seriously with somebody who have dedicated their career to safety that works for OSHA. Uh, that goes a long way to helping that inspection get off to the right, uh, you know, the right footing there.
Lastly, I mentioned this earlier, using market forces to make the data public, uh, OSHA continues and will continue to make it easier for employers uh, and the general public to search through this data. Um, to go through the regulation, they, they mentioned a book that was very popular within government circles at the time of the law that was put in place. They talked about using market forces to, to create behavior, a book called Nudge. Um, so they say, hey, if we publicize this data, it's going to encourage companies uh, to want to protect their reputation and and uh, and take safety seriously. So just note that in the future years, they're going to make it even easier for employers and the general public and trade associations and unions to search through this data. And they're already using this data against Amazon, as I mentioned earlier. OSHA under the Biden administration. So um, this is where we'll just talk a little bit about what we see going forward. Um, if you look at uh, uh, Biden's campaign website, as I know you all have done and you've memorized it at this point, right? Um, but if you looked at it, they did make specific mention of OSHA and they talked about their desire to double the number of inspectors. And if I think if you go on their website, even today, you'll see there's this now hiring section and, and they want to really uh, bring more inspection activity and bring more people to the, uh, the organization as a whole. Focus on enforcement. The biggest thing going forward is um, the fact that OSHA is targeting next year for employers to, in addition to all the data we talked about today, but another level of criteria, you will also, as an organization, have to submit data from your 300 log, which right shows each individual injury, how well you're categorizing them, how well you're describing them, as well as the form for each individual injury that you have. Uh, so that is a, a significant change. Um, this was a news release that was out. So I took a snapshot of OSHA's website here this morning. This was March 28th of this past year. And they talked about the fact that the current reg regulation requires certain employers who electronically submit data um, that they're already required to keep, right? We talked about that, your OSHA forms. The agency uses these reports to identify and respond to emerging hazards and make aspects of the information publicly accessible. In addition to reporting the annual data, which employers have to do now, the proposed rule would require certain establishments in certain high hazard industries to electronically submit their other log data as well. So what are we talking about here? So companies then with 100 or more employees in those certain high-risk industries would then, in addition to the 300A, send in the 300 and the 301. So that is in the current rulemaking process right now of going through. It will not go into effect uh, before this submission season, but uh, all the experts and folks believe it will uh, be ready to go for next year's submission process. So I tell you that now. So as you're doing next year's logs, you know, take care, fill them out correctly, um, and it's just going to make that submission process that much easier for you when we come around to this next year. So that is, again, all three forms that uh, that uh, you will have to report. So what you should, should you do now? So, of course, finish, update your 2022 records. If you have access to OSHA logs already, I know many of you do on the call, log back in. You know, if you haven't added or updated your logs just yet, Now's the time to do that. Look for missing data, look for errors, update your previous logs. Like I said, you they can ask for up to five years back. Starting the submission process for this year's law uh, data will start January 1st, and you have until March 2nd to do that submission. OSHA logs, in addition to the electronic submission process, makes it takes a guesswork out of OSHA record keeping, makes it a breeze makes injury analysis, debris, metrics, all sorts of great stuff. You get a login, you log on, you fill out one simple form. It's gonna automatically generate all three of these forms for you. You can also use this to create any state's workers count first report. So a lot of those data is the same stuff. So we can save time there. Uh, employers love that feature. If you need to make a change and do it once, it carries out through all the forms. And because it's all comes from one data source, no mistakes between the forms. Really slick injury metrics in there as well. Also for this year, we added uh, near, near miss metrics in the system as well. And of course, the electronic submission process. You log in at oshalogs.com. 
Um, if you haven't been in there recently, we made a really uh, uh, some slick improvements to the system this year. Uh, so it's made some visual enhancements. We've added some new, you know, record keeping wizards and support and help. Um, and uh, this year too, with the electronic submission process, um, it uh, it uh, again it was easy before, but we've just added some nice bells and whistles to the process. So if you log in now, if you go to electronic submission right at the top of the screen, you're going to see where it says, "Hey, we." Uh, are working on the submission a wizard. We're working on that. It will be open um, and ready for January 1st for you guys to submit. You will get an email that you know when it's ready to go for you guys to submit. Um, if you haven't gained access to OSHA log just yet through Rogers Gray, reach out to Greg or the representative that uh, you know from Rogers Gray that got you on the call today. They will give you scholarship access to the system. Um, of course, in their role, the risk managers focus on insurance. They want to help companies, of course, save money on their insurance. But really, the reason why I love working with Greg and his team is because they have a mission uh, there uh, in their neck of the woods uh, to help companies be proactive. Use these OSHA records as the ultimate canary in the coal mine of potential risk issues, potential problems. Um, there's all sorts of research that shows you out, uh, companies out there that you know, severe incidents don't just pop out of nowhere. There are there are warning signs that can be found and can be uh, explored on these OSHA logs before something severe happens. Of course, not only is this going to help you save money on your insurance, uh, but it's more than that. You know, it's about we we want to save lives. We want uh, people in your community to go home healthy and safe each and every day uh, to their families. And so, I always love doing these webinars. This is my small way to give back. To my my friends um, there at Rogers Gray, I know this is a, a way for uh, Greg and the folks there to give back to their community. So I thank you for that. I am one minute under our, our uh, end time. Um, I am here and will last as long as we want to, Greg, for questions. I am an open book. Yeah, so we have a, a couple of questions come in. Um, bunch of contractors on, so it seems like if the first couple are gonna be down that road. Um, we have a couple larger GCs that have projects that run more than a year with a job trailer on site. What are the triggers that a job site becomes a location and how many people need to be at that location all the time before we have to really consider it one and then report? Yeah. So the key thing they look at is that time metric. It is uh, over a year. So if they uh, are having a you know short-term establishment, as they call them, that go over a year, that is where it triggers where they need to uh, uh, treat that as its own establishment. It doesn't matter how many employees they have at that establishment. It is the length that they are going there and working there. I will tell you, Greg, in my history, and I know we've worked on some of these, you have these kind of funky establishment scenarios, and you may ask one ocean inspector the same question. You may ask three of them. And I'll give you a little bit different answer. So if you do have a quirky scenario and you don't want to be the one and you know asking OSHA and you want some intermediaries to ask the question for you to make sure you have the establishment set up correctly, well, we can help with that too. Yeah, for anybody that gets set up on the portal after this, there's an easy push button, ask a question, and they get back to you pretty quick. Most of my clients go there first and then uh, yeah. come and it gets really crazy. Um, yeah. The other thing that came up during COVID, similar concept is a lot of executive supers that went to Zoom meetings rather than site visits, worked out of state, went to Texas, whatever, were hanging out. When does their house become a location or an establishment? That is a, a good question. Um, I'd have to get back with you on that one to make sure because um, there has been some changes there. You know, there, there's, there's scenarios. Um, I'd, have to, I'd have to get you back on that one. Yeah. That I can um, and then a couple others that came through uh, for companies. This is going to sound like we planted this, but I swear this came in from somebody. For I companies that may not have access to resources like Rogers Gray, how is OSHA notifying of these changes? Well, um, that's a great question. That is not a planted question, but isn't that funny how you ask that, you know? Um, Think of it in a different scenario. Are you getting a nice letter with a full explanation of how to pay your taxes every year from the federal government? You know, are you getting all the rules and regulations that you have to follow as as a uh, as a company? Um, the onus is on the employer to follow the rules and to do it right. So that is why the wonderful folks at Rogers Gray and 
my organization, we, we fill that void to not only communicate, whether you use OSHA logs or not, but we put these, these informational sessions out there to fill that void. Okay. Uh, it's not like a self-service question, uh, right? But that was not a planted question. Yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, next question is, uh, you mentioned these forms should be accessible in the break room. Are there any HR or HIPAA issues with posting logs with, you know, med medical, seemingly medical nope. data? Nope. So again, the one you post is the summary data. There's no employee names listed on that. So there's no way for anybody to connect that to somebody else. So you do not post the 300, which has the individual employee's name. And even beyond that, there are certain scenarios that you can't put the person's name on the OSHA log because of privacy cases, like if somebody was injured in a private area or anything to do with blood. But uh, for your specific question there, Greg, the 300A is not uh, 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 covered under HIPAA. Um, if you don't have any recordable incidents in a given year, do you fill out just the summary? Is there anything you have to do with the other two forms in that instance? And I'll add on, do you have to submit it if it's blank? Uh, you don't, of course, the log. So if you use an OSHA log, you put your log year in there and it'll allow you to pull that OSHA 300A. You still have to do the 300A. That's going to have your summary data like all zeros for the injuries, but it's going to have your number of employees. It's also going to have the number of um, uh, total hours worked. That goes into the calculation, and um, you need to do that. And then if you have over 20 for that location, like the little question you uh, tagged onto there, Greg, uh, yes, you need to submit that. OSHA wants to see those companies who have zero injuries because that's going to help them get an average DART rate for a specific industry. So yes. Those other forms, you won't have to do anything because you had no injuries. They'll be there, but they'll have zero data on it. So let's say OSHA does come by, and for five years, you have zero injuries. Yeah, you want to be able to show your OSHA log with, with zero injuries, your OSHA 300. And that'll do it all within the system for you. Uh, and then we've got a, does submitting the OSHA 300A via OSHAlogs.com take the place of submitting to the government's website? And yes, when you go through it, it actually connects the two together and just helps you upload it. Yep, we're submitting for you. We actually added a step in there as well. So um, we actually have, um, when we work with OSHA, um, we ask them for their list of red flag data. So when you submit data and you do as much submissions as we do, they have a process, they send it back. They said, hey, some of the data looks off and this, you know, this could cause, you know, a red flag with an OSHA system, they can come ask and that could trigger an inspection. For example, if your number of hours and employees are without a range that they're looking for, it could cause a, a flag. So we actually built some tools in the system where it'll catch those red flag scenarios for you. So um, yeah, we'll submit for you, but we're also helping you make sure you're not submitting bad data. Okay, uh, a little bit more technical one. Um, what happens if the injury happens in one year and then the days away bleed into the next year? So injury happened in December of 21, days were still missed in 22. Does that show up on the 22 log, the 21 log, or both? Uh, 21 log. So you count the days, but even if those days are in the 22, you're bringing those days, total days, out of the 21. They want to know how many days injury, how many injury days are happening for injuries in that year. So it would not be in the 22, just the 21. And then the usual follow-up I get to that is uh, when they start looking at it, does the day of the injury count or is does that one get excluded that stays after that? Especially for our wonderful general contractor friends on the call today, you know, if you're um, in a, a area where general contractors are asking for your OSHA log and they're looking for DART rates, that DART rate number, I, I know a lot of GCs use that and OSHA uses that. Um, and so I will see a lot of times where companies will put one day away and I know what they're doing is they're putting the day of the injury. And so, um, no, you do not count the day of the injury. If you do, your dart rate will be way inflated and you're going to get, um, you know, in the crosshairs of, of OSHA and you're going to look way on, on a safer compared to your competitors and, and you don't want to do that. So I, I think that's all the questions I have so far. If there's anything else anybody wants to ask, um, we'll hang out for a minute and do that. The slides from today will be available. Uh, I know a couple of people asked to get added to the portal as well. So we will follow up 
uh, in the next day or so with what information we need to get you signed up and, and get you rolling there. Um, other than that, we appreciate everybody's time. And, and you know, if anything comes up after the fact, you can always reach out to me or anybody else at Rogers Gray. We'll connect with Dustin where we need to. Um, but I will say I've had a couple of clients that have had some issues and for them to pull them up uh, at a job site, significant injury and not have OSHA show up at their office or other sites because they couldn't produce them. They did it in five minutes, pulled out their phone, logged in. Here's my log, put the whole thing to bed right there. Obviously, you don't want to see anybody get hurt, but you really don't want OSHA doing a deep dive uh, after the fact, you know, while you go find your paper files and, and try to get them over. So um, like I said, no cost to use it. Pretty much everybody I know that's been put on it loves it. So uh, then there's some other cool features too, first report of injury and some other things that you can do on it for workers comp. Awesome. We love it. We love helping your folks, Greg. All right, perfect. We'll let everybody get uh, back to their day on something more fun than OSHA. And uh, we're here if you need us. Thank you, everybody.